Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, welcome to everyone here uh, in uh, the room and also to all of the participants that are joining uh, virtually. Uh, this event is being live streamed on YouTube and also the COP26 channel platform. Uh, just to say we will have to finish on time at 2.30 sharp. Uh, I am hoping we will have opportunity for questions from yourselves. Uh, so if you're in the room, that would be via one of the microphones. But also, if you're participating virtually, you'll also be able to ask uh, questions. So um, get ready with those questions. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce uh, someone who really needs no introduction, uh, Her Excellency, uh, the ex Executive Secretary of the UN Climate Change Secretariat, Patricia Espinosa. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you uh, for that kind introduction. <laughs> thank you. Um, Honorable ministers and distinguished delegates, dear friends, those who are here, those who are following also remotely, virtually, it's really my pleasure to welcome you to this event on the needs of developing countries. We know that meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement requires knowledge and understanding of the specific needs of developing countries in terms of climate finance, technology, capacity building, and much more, to ensure that they can fulfill their national mitigation and adaptation goals. These needs have been communicated in NDCs, national adaptation plans, technology needs assessments, and other reports and documents. Adequate funding must follow to ensure timely implementation of climate action. And at this conference, we are all aware, it is so evident to all of us that uh, the urgency that is required really um, implies that we need to act immediately. At COP23, the Secretariat received a clear mandate uh, from parties to assist developing nations in assessing their needs and priorities and translate these needs into action. The needs-based finance project, and you have uh, today uh, uh, the update on, on the project has been circulated, is one way that we in the Secretariat are responding to that mandate. Through this project, we have been collaborating with more than 100 countries in 12 regions of the world, from Melanesia and different regions in Asia to Africa, the Caribbean, and countries in Latin America. We have worked with governments and regional organizations to help them assess and communicate their priority adaptation and mitigation needs. The project helps address also common regional needs. It does this by facilitating access and the mobilization of climate finance. The ultimate deliverable of this project is to help participating developing countries to implement important mitigation and adaptation actions. All needs-based finance activities follow a step-by-step -step approach, a step-by-step a step -step process. Countries take stock of what is flowing in terms of finance, summarize their needs, and state their challenges. On this basis, decision makers agree on strategic approaches to unlock finance and implement priority actions with key partners. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear 
from distinguished ministers about the progress their countries are making in needs determination, the challenges they face, and which strategic approaches they are taking to increase climate finance flows. We know that efforts are required from both sides. Developed countries must deliver on the mobilization of 100 billion annually in climate finance and beyond. And developing countries must create an enabling environment in which ambitious climate projects can be developed and investments made. Going forward, we need to continue working on the priorities that developing countries have identified. First, it is clear developed countries must continue to steadily scale up climate finance, especially for adaptation. Grant-based finance for the poorest and most vulnerable should be enhanced as part of a wide variety of financial instruments to ensure there are adequate financial flows available for those who most need them. To effectively address barriers to accessing climate finance, it is essential that developed and developing countries work closely together. This event and the work discussed here today are a chance to come together, to learn from each other, to collaborate and to find solutions so that we can accelerate actions, which is really what needs to happen now. So I want to thank all of you for coming to Glasgow despite the very difficult circumstances imposed for traveling around the world. And I also want uh, to thank you for your work in translating plans and needs into actions, projects that will enhance our uh, goals, our, our uh, capacity to address the biggest challenge of humanity, which is climate change. Thank you very much for your commitment and thank you for inviting me to be here today. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And, and I know um, you are extremely busy here uh, during COP26, so uh, I understand you will not be able to stay for the whole session, but thank you for taking the time to join us. So now I'm delighted to invite our keynote speak, uh, His Excellency uh, Yishi Penyor, who is the Minister of Agriculture and Forests of Bhutan. And uh, Bhutan is currently holding the chairmanship of the uh, LDC Group, uh, which, uh, of course, one of the uh, key constituencies here, and uh, delighted that you could join us, Minister. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, those who are physically present here and those who are online uh, from the remote areas. It is my pleasure to be here at the high level event addressing the needs of the developing countries. Needs of developing countries, as Her Excellency Patricia has sounded, more so of the LDCs is simple and straightforward. Our needs are finance, technology, and capacity building. At Cancun, the COP16 committed US dollar 100 billion climate finance by 2020. 2021 is ending. The account is still far away from accomplishing the commitment of US dollar 100 billion. 
Paris Agreement is stating a commitment of a balanced climate financing between mitigation and adaptation. Climate financing today is overwhelmingly for mitigation. Adaptation is the need of the developing countries. LDCs, are not con uh, LDCs have not contributed to GHG emissions, but we are impacted the most. Adaptation is estimated to cost US dollar 140 to 300 billion per annum. Scaling up of the adaptation uh, finance is therefore urgent. Climate finance for adaptation has to be in grants. We are suffering from the gains of our partners. Why should we avail loans to adapt to the challenges created by others? Grants must be prioritized in climate financing so that developing countries can build resilience to climate challenges and cooperate towards low emission development. Mitigation is the responsibility of the developed countries. How to fund mitigation is in the hands of the responsible nations. The need of the developing countries here is emission reduction towards withholding the global temperature rise within 1.5 degrees Celsius. Rules for market mechanism is a technical priority for developing countries, a mechanism that leads to reduction in global emissions, a mechanism that ensures common accounting and regulatory framework overseeing trades for environmental integrity. Developing countries need actions and support for loss and damages. Climate change is hurting the poorest nations that have hardly contributed GHG emissions. Farmers in Bhutan recently lost their rice harvest to unprecedented rainfall and flooding and landslides damaged agriculture fields and road infrastructures. The damage is severe on their food security and livelihood. Who will stand responsible and pay compensations to such uh, loss and damages? Developing countries need COVID recoveries aligned with climate goals. Global leaders are aiming to recover to pre-pandemic pre state. Please, never let the world to go back to pre-pandemic. We must strive to go post-pandemic. COVID pandemic, must, uh, COVID pandemic must be a reset button to revive and trigger post-pandemic economic activities with green technologies. Investors are expected to invest in green technologies where there is leadership and political commitment. Many countries have this year presented updated, more ambitious NDCs and new global initiatives and support opportunities have been announced in the last few days. We need to keep increasing these efforts because evidence tells us that we are not on the track towards our shared goals. My country, Bhutan, despite our environmental credentials of maintaining 71% of the land under forest cover, with 51% of the land area protected as national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, and biological corridors. We are not spared from extreme climate change such as flash floods, glacial lake outbursts, forest fire, pests, and diseases. It is really worrisome that our water resources from the small streams and springs are drying up. Addressing these current and future events requires a several trillion dollars big scale transformation. Unfortunately, the latest estimation of climate finance by the OECD indicate that mobilized resources for developing countries are only around $80 billion per year. That is indeed a big gap in the funding needs. For an ambitious achievement, countries should identify and assess their diverse range of needs that have to be addressed for successfully implementing and delivering their, uh, their climate plans. With diverse limitations, yet developing countries, NDCs indicate that needs for developing countries are valued in the range of five to nine trillion dollars only up to 2030. Overall, fund, overall funding for adaptation represents only 25% of total climate finance mobilized. 
In overall, what is key at this stage is that funding becomes available, simple to access, and delivered through fair conditions. Once countries have their plans and projects ready, finance should be ready to implement them. Among the, among the things our countries is we don't need, uh, what we don't need is increased burden from uh, application processes and increased debt from loans. I hope the event today will provide facilitation access to, uh, for easy access to and mobilization of climate finance taking into account the country's NDCs, national adaptation plans, and other relevant domestic policies. I thank you and touch the list. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. So I think as uh, we've heard today, uh, this uh, needs, high level needs-based uh, finance event uh, really represents um, a key step along the journey uh, for the critical agenda to ensure that countries can really have their needs uh, well prioritized and then supported, of course, uh, both in terms of needs, finance, technology, and capacity building. And so this project was uh, initially launched, as we heard, uh, in uh, 2016, well, at the uh, COP23, the Fiji's COP, and uh, the work has been underway since 2017. And I think uh, you may have seen it already, but um, there is a report uh, available, I think, at the door um, that provides an update of the progress with this report. And as the executive secretary said, over 100 countries have already been uh, supported and engaged in this project, uh, looking at both national needs as well as needs that can be uh, supported at the regional level, which we know in some cases uh, is particularly important. So the panel today, I'm delighted that we have uh, a, a very esteemed panel uh, joining us uh, to, uh, to provide more um, insight into the work that has been underway, uh, both at the national level as well as at the regional level. And I will now invite the panelists to join me uh, to discuss the key issues that they have been uh, exploring through this project. So first of all, um, I'm delighted that we have um, uh, His Excellency Ayes Said Kayam, the Attorney General uh, and Minister for Economy and Climate Change of Fiji, who of course uh, have been instrumental in launching this project through their uh, COP23 uh, agenda. Welcome, Minister. I'm also delighted to invite now to the, to the stage uh, His Excellency Mr. Mulwin Joseph, the Minister for Health, Wellness, and the Environment of Antigua and Bar Barbuda. Welcome. Uh, and uh, also delighted to invite Her Excellency Ms. Amanath Shauna, Minister of Environment, Climate Change, and Technology of the Maldives. Welcome. And last but not least, uh, delighted to invite Ms. Malagras de Camps, the Vice Minister of International Cooperation in the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources of the Dominican Republic. So welcome. So I'd like to first turn to you, Minister um, uh, for Fiji. Uh, if you could uh, let us have some insights into the importance of this project for you and the work that has been underway and how you are seeing this both from Fiji's perspective 
at the regional level, but also, of course, your, your leadership role on, on these issues uh, more broadly uh, here um, within the UNFCCC. Sure, thank you. Um, essentially, you know, we, we were talking about uh, finance, accessibility to finance, which is obviously a critical issue for many developing countries. Uh, and that pertains to the manner in which finance is accessed, the speed at which finance is accessed, and the ability to use the finance for the appropriate purposes, whether it's uh, for adaptation purposes and mitigation purposes. You'll find that many uh, small island developing states, indeed many low-lying countries, our friend from Maldives will tell us that uh, we require finance for adaptation. Our carbon footprint is almost negligible. In our case, it's 0.006%. It does not mean that we do not engage in mitigation. Uh, we do do that. However, there's a, there's a particular issue, as you know, with the, uh, with the $100 billion gap as highlighted by the Honorable Minister from Bhutan uh, earlier on. Uh, that needs to be met. Uh, I've got some statistics here, without getting into details. We literally are spending hundreds of millions of dollars uh, every year in subsidizing the fossil fuel industry yet we're having problem, you know, gathering uh, $100 billion uh, for, for climate uh, uh, finance. So I think they, they are the critical issues in, from that respect. I think with the, the minister also referred to the COVID environment, post-COVID environment. The COVID environment obviously has put additional burden uh, on many developing countries in respect of debt. Uh, economies have shut down. In some cases, obviously, in some countries, the debt to GDP ratio has doubled within a short period of time, uh, which means that it calls into, into play, if you like, the way in which we view debt. Our post-World War II economy has been fundamentally premised on a uh, Bretton Woods system, World Bank IMF on rebuilding Europe. Much of the world was still colonized. Uh, we are now decolonized, but the way that we view debt is very, very conventional. Uh, and accordingly, when your borders are shut down, when you're, you still have climatic events taking place. I mean, in our case, for example, we've had about three cyclones during the pandemic. The climatic change doesn't recognize whether you're pandemic or not. But the fact of the matter is you don't have, rev you have revenues dried up completely, which means your ability to adapt, your ability to mitigate for that matter, or indeed address and finance loss and damage uh, is critically affected. And it gets pushed to the back burner. So I think, you know, if you were able to grasp that, and as we've said previously in the past couple of uh, sessions uh, earlier yesterday and today, there's a huge linkage between mitigation, mitigation adaptation, and loss and damage. Um, the failure to mitigate much earlier on has met, meant that we have to adapt. The failure to now provide adequate financing and at, at, at a very expeditious rate has meant there's more now in loss and damage. So there's a flow in effect. So, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but essentially I just wanted to lay that out as, as the sort of fundamental basis for discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And yes, of course, the uh, combined effect of the pandemic uh, alongside uh, climate impacts is, uh, of course, a, a huge, uh, huge issue of, of grave concern. So um, uh, I'll turn now, maybe just turn to this side, to uh, Minister from Antigua and Ambuda, uh, Barbuda to uh, ask, how do you see these issues? I know uh, you've been uh, looking at all of the, the, these issues that uh, have just been mentioned earlier by the Minister from Fiji and, and Bhutan. Um, how are you now seeing this from Antigua's? perspective. Well, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. And um, let me begin by saying that um, it's an important opportunity at this COP26 in that um, certain uh, plans were agreed to uh, in Paris. And uh, five years elapsed, and um, many of the commitments that were made uh, were not fulfilled. For instance, the establishment of the $100 um, billion fund. I'm pleased that we have seen some progress. But the absence of funding has exacerbated the situation for small island developing states. 
one of the areas that, uh, where we should have strengthened is in the area of the adaptation. Uh, mitigation is important, but for small island developing states, uh, we need the funding in order for us to build resilience in our economy. Since uh, 2015, many islands, including Antigua and Barbuda, have been devastated uh, by hurricanes, and uh, we had to borrow in order to recover. And when you borrow and create debt, it uh, makes it far more difficult for you to raise financing on the, uh, when you have emergencies. And we had a situation in Antigua where an entire island, a sister island, was devastated. And the cost of recovery was well over $230 million. And the GDP of Antigua and Barbuda, about 25% of the GDP of Antigua and Barbuda. The absence of funding forced the leaders of Antigua, uh, and leader of Antigua and Dominica to uh, go to uh, the United Nations and seek assistance. Pledges were made. And only about 25% of the pledges, 25% of the pledges were, were met. And that's over four years ago. Um, that uh, disaster in Barbuda was in 2017. And now we're in 2021, and we have still not recovered. And uh, the funding out of the GCF uh, are not forthcoming from the fact that uh, the GCF is not designed to be able to uh, release funds on the basis of disasters. It takes two or three years to uh, develop a project, get a project executed, and then the funding flow. When you have um, a cyclone or a hurricane and your infrastructure is devastated, your, uh, your hospital, ho hospital devastated, your healthcare facility, is devastated and your educational facilities are devastated. You need immediate uh, funding for recovery or else you're not able to provide health care for your citizens or you're not able to educate your children. And that is the dilemma of small island developing states. Uh, what we are hoping is that the institutions become more nimble in order to meet uh, emergencies. And the GCF, for instance, the two windows are in GCF now, mitigation and adaptation. We are now finding that attention has to be placed on loss and damage. And uh, I think the time has come for there to be a third window that responds to emergencies. And this response is based on actual events where you have, in, uh, we have it in the Pacific, uh, we have it in the Caribbean, and um, we have it even in the uh, United States, and, uh, but they can afford to um, finance their own recovery. But small island developing states, for instance, uh, like um, uh, Maldives, uh, that uh, they rely on tourism, uh, when the airport is disabled, it impacts the main source of revenue for that country. Antigua and Barbuda is 90% reliant on tourism. There was an incident in 1995 when uh, there was Hurricane Lewis that almost totally destroyed uh, the airport uh, and uh, destroyed the hospital, and the economy basically came to a halt. Now, the question is, how can we redesign, redevelop these institutions to be more nimble to respond to the peculiar circumstances of small island developing states? That is the great challenge. I think the platform is there, the foundation is there to the GCF and to less extent the GEF, but we cannot continue to do things the same way. And if indeed we do not uh, protect 1.5 and keep it alive, then the situation will get worse. 
I'm hearing, unfortunately, at this COP that we might not be able to, uh, to uh, keep 1.5 alive. I trust that it's not the reality. But if you go beyond that and you go to um, uh, two degrees, then all these small island developing states will continue the face even with worse disasters. And I think that should be the attention of, um, particular attention of the COP at this particular time. Okay. Thank you, Minister. <coughs> so I turn to you, Minister, from Maldives. So you've been doing a lot of collaboration regionally uh, on climate finance with other states in the Indian Ocean uh, and also established some national funds as well. So could you tell us what your experience has been with these, uh, uh, experience at the national level as well as um, the, uh, the, the benefits of the regional collaboration that you've been leading? Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and particularly to speak on something that's very close to my heart as well as um, to Maldivians and um, all small island states um, who are represented here. First of all, um, climate finance is a very big challenge for us. Uh, climate change poses development and, and an existential threat on countries like the Maldives. With regard to um, accessing support for climate finance, one of the biggest problems that we have had so far is that the five-year period total, the needs that, um, totals to about half a billion dollars, and we have so far managed to achieve just uh, finance for only two projects, that is, um, in 2008, we, we developed a project and finance was approved in 2015. And then later, the, another project that was developed, the finance was received three years later from, from the GCF. And that one still remains to be realized. And for us to access this, um, the second one, we had to provide data that went back to 30 years to prove that what's happening in the Maldives is actually because of climate change. So as a small island country who is very much um, rest restrained with resources and other capacity restraints as well, this poses a huge threat because for us to even access these things, it, there's a huge bureaucratic uh, process that we need to un uh, undergo. Therefore, what has happened is because of lack of finance that has actually reached us, we are having to uh, finance these urgent adaptation needs from our domestic budget. We are financing up to nearly 35 to 40% of our adaptation from our domestic finance. That's either borrowing from our banks, which again is very limited because our domestic financial markets aren't as developed as in um, other countries. And borrowing from commercial banks from small island countries, which already um, heavily indebted to um, other um, financial institutions. So it makes it very, very challenging for us to um, do this. I think um, f f from the second part of the question was our collaboration with um, other Indian Ocean um, countries. What we have found is um, quite interesting. I mean, it shows a big gap between the needs and what, what they need and what they have received. Uh, what they need um, amounts to about $42.6 billion. What, uh, the, the total climate finance that has flowed so far to this region um, is about $6.6 .6 billion. So there's a, there's a massive uh, gap in, in the finance that has been realized. Also, a lot, over 60% of the finance that has reached were um, in the form of borrowing loans as well. But um, something that we have been um, really pushing for on adaptation is that adaptation finance must be grant-based as well. So this is something that has, we have not um, really received. And like you said, we, in, in the Maldives, we have um, done a few different things to, fund, to finance um, climate change. And one is we have um, 
5% of our tax revenue has been earmarked exclusively for environmental um, initiatives. Right now, our green taxes 100% goes to provision of clean drinking water to the islands because none of the islands in the Maldives have access to clean drinking water in, now. The, um, and so these, this is one, some, some of the things that we have been doing um, to finance our own adaptation measures as well because we can't wait until um, grant-based finance reaches us. Thank you very much, and uh, excellent work that, that's been underway um, with your uh, other island states in the Indian Ocean. Um, so now, um, uh, Vice Minister for Dominican Republic, um, uh, so I know you've been doing a lot as well uh, looking at these issues, and uh, uh, would love to hear more, you know, how, how you're uh, addressing these issues. And, and also, is there anything you you know, building on what you've just heard uh, that you might recommend, particularly to the climate funds maybe, mm -hmm. uh, that could maybe support your, your needs. Sure, so first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a uh, true honor to be here in this panel today. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat what his and her excellencies have said because the constraints, the, the difficulties we face as island states are very, very similar. Uh, as an island share with the neighboring uh, Republic of Haiti, the Dominican Republic is within one of the top 14 countries most vulnerable to climate change. And uh, Haiti is one of the top three most vulnerable to climate change. Uh, we're mostly uh, very affected by extreme weather events that are forecast, mainly floods, droughts, rising sea level. And it's our priority to become resilient like other small island developing states. We have done and are doing everything we have within our power. We increased our ambition to, uh, in our NDC to 27%, which might not sound like a lot, uh, but we, uh, we decreased the unconditioned percentage to 7% to, to uh, and only 20% will be conditioned to obtaining uh, financial uh, help. And the intention is to become carbon neutral by 2050, which is a big challenge for us. We have been focusing on transforming our energy, energy matrix. We currently have 30% of, uh, of renewables in our matrix and have become regional leaders in terms of electric mobility. And uh, we have been increasing forest coverage, reforestation efforts, which are focused mostly on coastal resilient as we're very, uh, uh, very weak when it comes to weather events. So planting mangrove trees along the coast of the country is one of our biggest strategies right now. Uh, developing blue economy and signing an emission reduction purchase agreement uh, at a very unfavorable price, I have to add though, uh, for the totality of our emission reduction. We have been increasing our protected areas, both marine and land, and restoring degraded sites along other things, but despite all these efforts, our constraints are the same, and it's, it's in terms of uh, finance access. The global and regional inequalities in access to finance and green technologies is huge. Uh, we are the second most indebted region, and I'm sorry, the, the most indebted region and the second least financed. There's very long application processes for international climate funds for project with diffuse rules and requirements, which require specialization and technical capacities that often do not exist in the countries and economic climate characterized by uncertainty, discouraging the investment from the private sector. So we've been trying to address these issues in a strategic manner, and we've been developing different financial mechanisms to, to access finance. So we've been creating conditions for access to finance, and we've also been developing a portfolio of projects uh, to access finance, uh, so for ready-made projects to access finance. So our, tr our strategy has been doing different things in parallel as we don't have the luxury of time. So we've been doing a, a green taxonomy, public-private alliances, we've been planning in, uh, sectorial interventions, uh, we've been developing a green development bank to accredit it to the GCF so it can concentrate uh, the access to finance and that institution and that way we wouldn't need to, to lose time transforming institutions that are very old and difficult to transform to the, to the different criteria that the GCF requires. So we're working on that as well. We've been uh, also working on uh, debt for climate swaps and debt for nature swaps. We've been developing green bonds and uh, we've been working on uh, a strategic uh, form uh, to, to form our 
our, our human capital so we can have the capacities in the country to, to develop and to execute projects. We've been doing also the portfolio of projects and this, this project has been very helpful for us, developing a portfolio for ready-made projects and an accelerator. So those are kind of like the, the things that we've been doing as, as a country to, to access finance in a fast and efficient way. Thank you, so a lot underway. Um, so maybe uh, just to remind everyone um, here uh, in, in the room and also online, if, if you would uh, like to ask a question to get ready with those. Um, and, uh, uh, but before I do, I might just uh, ask a follow-up question to each of our panelists. Um, so Minister from Fiji, you've also been quite involved in um, this access task force. Uh, could you say a little bit about that? Because I know there was uh, a launch earlier this week and how you see that maybe supporting uh, this agenda in particular. Well, access to Finance um, essentially is, um, uh, we're co-chairing with the UK. Um, there's uh, five countries that are on the, on the pilot program, mm -hmm. uh, which is Bangladesh, Rwanda, um, Fiji, um, one of the other Caribbean countries, sorry, the name escapes me, uh, and um, uh, two other countries. Uh, essentially, the idea is to um, ensure that we get financing for these different programmatic bases, and I think that's a fundamental issue in many countries now. Also, when uh, you have uh, even GCF uh, and various other bilateral partnerships, they, they're looking at only on a project basis of financing, as opposed to a holistic programmatic basis, which is critically important, as in all the panelists over here will tell you, uh, that you don't just simply have one project in their country, that you need to take a holistic approach. And I think sometimes what happens is that people tend to cherry pick projects, and there's also duplication, some you know, particular areas may be, may be the in thing to do, and so others get neglected. Um, so this particular program is about accessing finance, uh, expediting the process, and they'll be piloting it with, the, with these countries. Uh, and we hope to, of course, um, uh, similarly then try and replicate that throughout. Um, some, one of the panelists also mentioned, for example, with, with GCF. Um, to give you an example, uh, in Fiji, the Ministry of Economy um, recently went through the various accreditation process. Uh, to access green climate funds. The various policies had to be put in place. They've done all of that. They've paid the fee to actually join or get access to funds to GCF. It's been six months we're waiting for accreditation. In the meantime, you know, uh, sea walls need to be built. There's water inundation. We've had 43, identified about 43 to 46 villages or places of uh, residents that need to be located to higher ground. 40 are waiting there. So I think uh, with this particular program with the, with the UK, and we're quite, quite grateful for this, is that the idea would be to develop modules as to how we can expedite and streamline processes in terms of accessing finance and on a programmatic basis. And I think that's critically important to do so. Thank you. Very, very interesting. And I think, so um, uh, Minister uh, Joseph, you, you mentioned um, I mean, of course, this need to be much more nimble, um, and uh, particularly when thinking about, um, you know, directly after a, a major disaster. Um, and of course, you know, everyone here on this panel, every country is uh, a member of AOSIS, uh, and uh, you recently published a leader's declaration, I think, uh, on, on these challenges and calling for more support in the areas of adaptation and also the energy transition. So um, can you say maybe a little bit more about that and what you see uh, that as the implications for particularly the financial um, mechanism uh, and, and also the UN system as well? Actually, um, the small island developing states have decided to take a holistic approach to the response to climate change. Uh, in Antigua and Barbuda, for instance, um, we have embarked on an aggressive program of eliminating plastics out of our environment. Um, the pollution of the, um, uh, the, the seas, the oceans with plastic is a major problem. 
uh, we have been able to access support of uh, some other UN agencies in order to, um, to establish a program that will uh, look at plastic as a resource rather than waste. And so we are uh, pursuing a project where plastics can be used to uh, be converted into furniture that's required, for instance, in the tourism industry, like beach furniture and things like that, and even plastics in uh, mixing with um, the asphalt to uh, pave roads. Uh, Antigua and Barbuda is the first country in, the, in I think, in the Western Hemisphere uh, to successfully ban single-use plastic bags out of its environment. Uh, we, are, we are doing all this as a responsible global citizen uh, because the less plastic you use, the less fossil fuel is required. Uh, I think plastic is a byproduct of the uh, fossil fuel industry. Now, we need to take it a step further, and uh, that is to um, uh, do a quick transition into renewable energy uh, we have some projects now to establish wind energy and uh, solar energy in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, we're hopeful by in the next um, nine months or so, 25% of our um, energy requirement will be met to, to green energy. But we'd like to accelerate that. And, and the, the issue is, how do we access this funding in a reliable and um, efficient way? in order to accelerate. Even though the small island developing states contribute very little uh, to um, uh, greenhouse uh, gases, it is important for all nations to accept the urgency of the situation. And this is why the, N, um, the, the NDCs of um, the G20, for instance, uh, need to, be, to show a little more ambition, frankly. We need to see the small, uh, the, the, the larger countries stepping up and um, increasing the ambition to reduce uh, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. I do not think it is going to benefit the world in the long run that we continue to uh, think that we can dodge this bullet. I don't think it's, it's going to work. We have seen the evidence of, of, of the result of global warming and, um, you know, we might be looking down in the barrel of a gun if we do not take drastic steps to reduce greenhouse gases. And um, the interesting thing about the, the whole idea, if you heard the term looking in a barrel of a gun, is that with this gun, our, our fingers are on the trigger. We have the ability, as the occupants of this earth, to take drastic actions now in order to prevent the disasters that we see coming. Even we saw what happened in Germany with the floods, which is quite an unusual event. And we see what happened in recently in New York with the flooding. These are unusual events. And nobody should think that they're going to cease under the circumstances when we continue uh, to uh, burn these fossil fuels and, uh, and, and, and um, generate all these greenhouse gases. And the point that should be made, as it is now, the small island developing states, such as um, uh, Dominican Republic, um, Maldives, and Antigua and Barbuda, and, and Fiji, we are the ones suffering. And we think that um, we have a, a, a legitimate position to demand that when we suffer from these things, we be compensated. And at the same time, the large polluters must have a, think they have a moral responsibility to take drastic actions because it benefits no one. It benefits no nation in, anti, in, in the world for this condition to continue. And that's really why I think this COP is the crossroads, in my estimation, this is the fork in the road. This is why this COP is important. I'm afraid that if we do not get it right and get on the right road, that the cost that we have to pay is going to be at the expense of future generations. 
and even the expense of the current generation. So uh, that would be my, my, my message. And Antigua and Barbuda uh, certainly is committed to doing its part. So, um, Minister, uh, I mean, I think, you know, we've heard, uh, obviously, from, well, all of you, of the you know, severe challenges being faced, but also the criticality of um, you know, deeper commi commitments for emission reductions by the, particularly the larger countries. So, um, but just a question to you, because I know we often hear that, you know, some uh, small island developing states that are middle-income countries also can face some particular challenges accessing climate finance. Could you say maybe a little bit more about that? Um, thank you. And the Maldives is a middle-income country. And because of that, we, we find it very difficult to access much of the finance that is available to developing uh, countries. But our challenges are even m more challenging because we are a middle-income country, mm -hmm. and we don't have access to concessional financing that's available to other um, vulnerable countries because of our uh, status in that sense. Um, for instance, some some, in some instances, uh, financial institutions, and also even when it comes to bilateral um, aid provided to us, some are less or, or, or hesitant to engage with us because we are also seen as a luxury holiday destination as well. So that makes it more challenging to access a lot of the funds that's available. But although we are a middle income country, a lot of our problems that are related to climate change and adaptation are very, very similar to what's, ha what's in, in uh, the least developed countries as well. So. Um, we, 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 we're finding it very, we haven't had much luck actually with countries in accessing um, the kind of finance available um, to them. What um, I would like to add to what other ministers also said is how can we um, improve the um, financial instruments that are already available. I really think that we must urgently look into um, enhancing direct access to donor funds for, particularly for small islands, because from what the IPCC report says, we, we have just about two or three decades before we can, um, unless we urgently cut down our emissions, which I doubt that we might be able to agree to that even in this COP. Second of all, I think um, it's really because of the direction where things are going, I think it's really important that countries like the Maldives and small island states have access to emergency funds. And like um, the minister um, just had um, very um, nicely explained to us that it, it's very difficult when an island is flooded, when our schools are closed, when our health centers are closed, to, be, to wait for three years for a project to be approved. So that, and then the other one is that we really need to uh, speak and agree on the importance of loss and damage and uh, also adaptation finance in a balanced manner. So I just wanted to mention that since we are here, I think uh, we need to talk about what we expect from COP as well. Thank you. Um, so, Vice Minister, um, I mean, you mentioned you're developing a green fund or green bank, green development, green development bank, which sounds very interesting. How are you, what, what do you see the role of that new institution in being able to address some of your needs? Sure. So, we don't have any direct access entities accredited to the GCF in the Dominican Republic. We have only one accredited to the adaptation fund uh, they recently approved getting a second uh, entity accredited. So what we're seeing is the need to have a, an institution that can finance both for first floor banking and second floor banking uh, projects for the private and the public sector. So what we're trying to develop is a, a green banking institution that has a mixed governance and can provide funding and can be central or can uh, 
can capture the funding from different financial institutions uh, and, uh, and different private sec sector institutions also for uh, climate change projects or green development projects. And this institution will be from the start created as an institution to be accredited to all of the, of the funds and an institution that will have efficient and effective ways of accessing funds for different instruments in different sectors. So that's our idea behind the Green Development Bank. We've been trying to access the Green Climate Fund for many years and we've only had access through international ac uh, institutions uh, that have very high, uh, at a very high cost. And that's, uh, we need more and we need it now. We, our story is a story of inequality and a story of uh, immediacy and a story of, of uh, action. We need, we need action now. Uh, we cannot wait anymore. Absolutely. So um, I think we probably have maybe just under 10 minutes for some a Q and A session. Um, so if you're here in the room and would like to ask a question, please go and move to one of these um, uh, microphones. There's one here. There's number one, number two, number three, number four. Um, and also, of course, you can ask um, if you're participating online. Um, uh, you can also uh, submit a question that uh, uh, I understand will flag uh, to me that there is your question has come up. So um, uh, please, oh, I see uh, at microphone number three. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, this is a question particularly for the Minister of Antigua. You talked about the need for drastic steps to reduce greenhouse gas emissions but yet the 90% dependence of your economy on tourism, and also the need for G20 countries like the UK to do more to reduce our NDCs. Would you support the UK to cut down flights as a way of reducing our carbon footprint and, and reduce the amount of flights to countries like yourselves for tourism, and instead support your countries to have a more climate resilient development pathway that didn't include international aviation as part of your future carbon footprint? Well, I don't think it's really in my uh, responsibility to try to influence the policy of the UK, the economic policy of the United Kingdom. Uh, the fact is, though, that I've heard that um, there are efforts and consideration to uh, improve the efficiency of transportation, air transportation and land transportation. I think that uh, the, nest, the, the technology evolving in the world right now has demonstrated, for instance, in Antigua, where we are transitioning uh, from fossil fuel vehicles to, um, uh, to electric vehicles. It's happening in the UK, and I think ultimately uh, it will happen with aircrafts. And, and so uh, I think that you are likely to see a progression uh, towards that. Um, and uh, I'm sure that the United Kingdom, um, having uh, uh, so uh, carefully and effectively managed this COP26, uh, they're likely to be a leader in that regard. And this is not only the United Kingdom, but the entire world. Uh, air transportation must also um, adopt technology to uh, reduce the emissions in the atmosphere. So I'm optimistic in that regard. That's one p particular area that um, is making tremendous progress. When I go to Europe, every, just about every car that I drive in vehicle, uh, they, they are transitioning into electric vehicles. I think it's going to, it's going to happen here as well. Great, thank you. Oh. Yes, please. Um, I, I'd like to comment on that too. I'm mean, coming from a tourism country ourselves. So I think the three, four of us are probably all tourism-based countries. I think what, what the, the minister has just said is absolutely correct, but I think to have this fallacy that immediately we should stop international aviation because of the carbon footprint, I think would put additional burden on developing countries itself. I think you're forgetting the equation. The fact of the matter is that many developing countries, like island developing countries, are able to fund the adaptation programs by raising revenue through tourism 
We, for example, in Fiji have an environment climate adaptation levy. Uh, you seem to be shaking your head. I'm not sure whether you agree with me or not. But we have an environment climate adaptation levy uh, that we put on tourists. If, in the same way, for example, with the pandemic, we saw the borders closed down. There was no flights. We lost 50% of our revenue immediately overnight. We have to pay large sums of unemployment benefit. We have to stop many of the seawall building projects. Uh, we have a pressure on the health system. So, as the minister highlighted, the technology in respect of civil aviation, international civil aviation, will obviously will, will, will improve. You have a problem in UK, I understand, recently in your budget, you has announced that you're going to subsidize domestic aviation travel. That's a separate matter to international travel aviation. So, I think that, that really needs to be put into perspective because, you know, Maldives is over a million tourists, or more than that, a lot more than we do, um, and we wish we had their numbers. But the fact of the matter is that tomorrow, if you stop and say to all tourists, please catch a boat, uh, electric boat, and go to Maldives, it will simply not work. So I think what we need to look at is how do we have sustainable tourism? That's critically important. So the hotels, what sort of energy do they use? Do they have programs in their you know, in, in the hotel uh, activities, are they sort of nature-based? Uh, those are the things that we need to look at holistically as opposed to just looking at it from a one-dimensional perspective. Thank you. Okay. And I think, Minister Shona, you want to come back on this as well. Um, I see we have uh, two more people. Um, so, uh, would you like to... Yes, I have two more questions, then I will come to you, or do you want to respond to this question? Is it... We, it's a new question. Okay, well, we'll, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll have to be brief. So, Minister Shona, if you want to respond to this, and then I'll ask each of the three questions to provide, uh, to ask the question, and then um, ask each of the panelists to respond um, briefly, because I know we are about to run out of time. I just want to quickly uh, respond to that, because the Maldives is also heavily dependent on tourism for all our development needs. I don't think that anyone should have a free card including international aviation and including our tourism industry. But the point is, even if the Maldives goes car carbon neutral, net zero today, we're not going to reach the goal of limiting global temperatures to 1.5. Our contribution to climate change is negligible. So the Maldives will be your number one advocate for decarbonization of international aviation and also maritime transport. What we don't have is access to technology and finance. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe um, we'll stop microphone four, microphone three, and then microphone one, if you'd like to ask your, your questions um, in that order. Thank you very much. My name is Eric Lokolong. I am from the East African Development Bank in Africa. Uh, over the last few days, we have been hearing very loud drums of quick and urgent need for global action to tackle the challenges of climate change and adaptation. The bank is currently undergoing a process of being accredited to the GCF and in my mind, I am just hallucinating how uh, the other side of the world will help us support climate change and adaptation by raising cheap sources of uh, funding for purposes of uh, supporting our communities. Uh, I would like a comment from either one or all of you on this to give us some assurance that we have some light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. So maybe now we'll have question uh, on number three, microphone three. Yes, I, I was originally from Sri Lanka, which is a country which also has a, a big tourism industry. And I would like to take this even more holistically than uh, the minister from Antigua and Barbados, I think. Uh, that is to say, uh, Sri Lanka Maldives and these uh, island states have lived for a long time without a mass tourism industry. And the question is, do we need, is it adequate today, 
has it got any meaning for us to continue uh, in this mass tourism industry, which does not at all increase understanding between cultures? I can uh, uh, develop that, but I know that I don't have the time, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, sir, if you could come to this microphone number one, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, really. I want to thank all the ministers uh, present here. Uh, I learned a lot from the experience, and uh, they made a brilliant uh, communication for us. Me, I'm Ibila Jibri from Benin in West Africa. Uh, we are in the process to finalize our NBF strategy in West Africa, which comprises 15 countries, including Nigeria, the big Nigeria with a large population. So uh, when uh, I listen very well your presentation, uh, I have one question. Uh, the NBF, uh, NBF uh, initiative is to improve or to increase the mobilization and to facilitate access to the climate finance. So uh, you are in the implementation phase now. Uh, maybe it's not the time to assess what is done, but we can withdraw some uh, first lesson from your implementation phase. What can be? Uh, from your point of view, the first lesson we can withdraw from your experience in the implementation of SBN. What is working very well? What is not working? And how we can bridge the gap between our needs of climate finance and the access? We need really to have a good balance between mobilization and the assessing. If this is not realized, the objective of NBF is not achieved. And we need really to show that there is a way to improve, to innovate, in order really to bridge the gap between the need of mobilization and also uh, the, 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 the need of access to climate finance. This is very fundamental. Uh, I listen to you very careful, and uh, I know the situation in West Africa is not the same in the houses of country. But as developing country, we have the same problem. The main problem is really to mobilize money we need in order to undertake some concrete project we can allow us to, to tackle climate change impact in our country. So I will be very happy to, to hear from you, your experience. And my final question is that uh, when we need to mobilize uh, financing resources, I would know, I would like to know exactly what is the national path in this mobilization on each of your country, in each of your country. What the national budget bring in this process? Because we know if we wait from external resources, it will be difficult. The climate Sorry. change project is really very really difficult. It's not possible to, to undertake climate climate project without uh, uh, some capacity building. Thank you, sir. So, thank you, very thank you much. sir. No, no, really, really important points. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm afraid, though, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to ask the panelists to respond because we are pretty much out of time. And also, I apologise um, to the lady who's just stood up at the mic at four. Um, <coughs> Uh, because we have now uh, just some very final closing remarks from uh, Mr. Daniele uh, Violetti, please. <coughs> I will not mind. Good afternoon. Good afternoon mm -hmm. to all of you, participants uh, and uh, delegates, uh, excellencies. Uh, um, First of all, I would like to thank the ministers for, for joining us today in this very important event uh, uh, on behalf of the UN Climate Change Secretariat and for the contribution to this very important con conversation. Um, we know we are all here to, uh, to make sure that we can keep the 1.5 goal 
within reach, right? This is our main goal and task. And, and uh, having the, your experience from your countries uh, is definitely uh, a strong message of urgency coming to, to all of us. So looking at the finance side of things, we have heard that donors must allocate half their climate finance to adaptation and public and multilateral development banks should start as soon as possible this process of, uh, let's say, re really reallocating the resources to where are more needed. And the 100 billion a year climate finance commitment uh, must become a reality. We know that there is a, a roadmap for that. Uh, we know that the timing is not what was expected, but we have now to build on that to move forward for the implementation. And we heard again today that uh, a good understanding of the needs of developing country is crucial to ensure finance is channeled towards the right priority mitigation adaptation action and contribute to ensure timely implementation of the NDCs and national policies. Uh, most importantly, um, we need to consider local priorities in, in the distribution of climate finance uh, in, a, in a way to achieve an inclusive process, timely implementation, uh, political buy-in and long-term success of projects. So through the needs-based finance project, the Secretariat has supported an approach centered around the on-the-ground reality, needs and challenges of developing countries. In our engagement, many countries have told us that access to finance, and has been underlined by your intervention as well, and as well as enabling capacity is an urgent need. I would say a priority, if to me, is, is critical. Capacity on the ground is key, capacity to assess needs, develop and cost projects, write proposals, understand the climate finance landscape, and ultimately mobilize funding. And we have heard from you today about the challenges your countries are facing in accessing climate finance. But also we've heard about the solution that you are developing and, and the steps taken in that direction. Uh, I, I, you know, I unfortunately didn't follow the full discussion. I know you talk about emergency funding for loss and damage, uh, uh, nimble institutions for funding, uh, uh, all centered about the, 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 the priorities of your countries for the way they are. So um, one thing that the Secretariat side, I'm very happy to uh, uh, share with you that uh, thanks to the generosity of several donor countries, uh, including developing countries, uh, uh, the needs finance project can continue to provide support for at least three more years. So now we were able to secure this for three more years and we will continue to do that. So we, as a, as a climate change secretary and supported by our regional coverage centers, look forward to support the implementation phase of the projects and, and, and more um, within our capacity, of course, but we will put all our effort moving now in implementation of the Paris Agreement. So my team and I, we are really ready to support you and uh, Excellencies, wish you a successful COP26. Thank you very much again for being with us. Coming in, and I know um, the the ministers, I'm sure, would be very happy to talk more about those either now or or at a later opportunity. So um, thank you very much for joining us uh, here in the room, and also all of those of you that have joined virtually. Thank you very much.